Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today's episode is based on the Impromptu in G flat major, Opus 90, number three by Schubert. And we're going to be going over each page in depth with, first of all, how do we get that um, inner voice really soft? What are some of the best practice strategies? How can we shape each of those lines? And just the overall interpretation with this piece. The concepts are very similar throughout the entire piece so far as the technical work of getting the inner voices softer. But there's so many different applications of how to do it effectively, especially when we get to the stormier places. <laughs> in the middle, how much filler do we actually want? So we'll be going over every measure of the piece today. This is such a, a beloved work and it has been something that has been requested for years. So I'm so happy to finally be tackling this. I recently played it at a concert um, and I actually did a lesson on it with my teacher too, just to make sure things were in place. So I'll have some of her tips as well in here. So a big thanks to Susan Duhlmeyer for all of her wisdom and guidance throughout the years. Um, I studied with her all the way through my master's degree ever since I was about 10 years old. And then I did studies with Sergei Babayan and Logan Skelton as well. So here we go. The first thing that I like to do is probably just take it hands alone. And I like to do a very basic voicing exercise. If any of you have watched my videos before, you know that I'm a big fan of this. There's really no shape in the tops yet. Shaping meaning like crescendos, diminuendos, fortes, pianos, like all of your dynamics. We're not doing that quite yet. We're just doing a very basic voicing exercise. The reason this is so helpful is I'm gonna play loud and forte on this and very soft on that. A couple of other ways to think about it because that doesn't always work for students. Think of this being made of metal and this being made of rubber. You can do it staccato. You could also try it legato. Okay. You could also think of, um, this is a little more dangerous. This is more for a chordal voicing, but you could think of the pinky or whatever voice is coming out the most, extending down further into the key and the other one staying a bit shallower. So if you want to voice a C major chord, but you want to bring that G out, just think of that pinky going down a little lower. I don't know if I would do that too much in here, but it may help. Another exercise that you could do that's very helpful is just touch the keys. And then add a little bit more sound. And then a tiny bit more and you'll be good. I recently did an interview with Graham Fitch and he said he likes to use the touching exercise for memorization. And I said, I, that's so funny because I've used the exact same exercise that just the touching the keys uh, to reinforce really soft textures to, to help myself get down into those softest, most velvety touches possible. Okay, let's talk about um, increasing that speed. Do we actually, I had a student who was working on this um, from New York and he said, do I need to actually physically hold this? And then... Ideally, if you have the control, yeah, it's great to hold it because then you can feel kind of the physical connection to the next key. But if your technique isn't cooperating, like if you're, if holding this causes you to go unevenly, then I would hold it for maybe one or two notes and then let it off because this is all going to be in the pedal, okay? And a general rule of thumb with this piece is when the harmonies change, change your pedal. Uh, and that can go for right hand changes as well. So you're not like on bar three here. If you don't like 
that blurring into that. You can do change, 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 change. I think sometimes you have to make a judgment call. Like I might not do that many changes there. Change. And then I might just change here. But as we get further along in the piece, like bar 21, for instance. Uh, sorry. I'm definitely going to want to change there. And then change, change, change. That's Those are enough. I guess you don't have to change between those two. But then change there as well. So <coughs> I would probably just do all of them. Change, 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 just to make things simpler. So that's kind of the basics with pedaling, and we'll go over more of that when needed. Um, but for the most part, every time you have a harmony change, uh, just make sure you're changing that pedal. And if it's an inversion of the same harmony, again, that's a judgment call as well. So if you were doing, this is not from this piece, but... The pedal's not necessarily muddy there because these are just inversions of G flat major. But but you may want to clear those out because you can hear the moving line a little bit easier. So that's just a general discussion. Okay. Another tip that I want to go over on how to get these softer is again, this is dangerous because a lot of people who don't have good technique, uh, if they try to do this, it can cause further error. But if you flatten your fingers slightly and you use just a little bit of rotation, whether you're flattening your fingers, you should use a little bit of rotation anyway. But if you just flatten those fingers a little bit more on the pads, rather than a really sharp like attack like that, the sharper your fingers are, in my opinion, the more uh, prone they are to be really light and, and often um, Pointed. So like in this, uh, Chopin Etude Opus 25, number two, I love sharp pointed fingers. So even though those are soft, it has a very pointed sound. It doesn't have this velvety, warm, inviting sound, okay? So I flatten the fingers slightly. I'm not playing like this, okay? Because I don't have any control there. So, and I'll think about stroking back, especially like on the on this first note, and then I'll stroke back on my thumb, and then I'll get moving. Another thing is, let's talk about, a little bit about tempo. <clears throat> I think there's quite a bit of leeway in here with how you choose your tempo, because the andante can be interpreted uh, as andante for and two, and, sorry, one, two and three and four. Or it could be involving a little bit more of these and we don't want to be kind of frantically like, frantically playing those. So I like kind of a mixture of saying, okay, I don't want the, the melody to lag. Sorry. That's probably the fastest I would go if you want to slow that down just a little. But I don't think I'd be going much slower than that. Because then it takes forever to get to your next note. This is for final temp, uh, tempi. Uh, whatever tempo you choose, you've got to um, keep these things in mind. However, when you're first practicing, I like to close my eyes and just... Get those as dreamy as possible in the middle. And then resolve, but don't be too soft where you can't hear it. Okay, we're getting a little bit into the shape. Again, what I would do, oh, really quick. That time signature uh, is something you don't see very often. Two different cut times. So uh, the way you count this I just like to think of it, double cut time. So one and two and one and two and, okay? 
That's how I would think about it at the performance level. When you are practicing it and you want to get the inner voices really even, forget about that marking because um, it's quite confusing to have that many notes for that few of beats. I just like to think one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a... This will especially come in handy when you're trying to figure out where some of these notes come, like uh, over on bar 18. And a two and a three and a four and a one. Does that come in between? Does that come with the last note? It comes in between those two, by the way, because you have to go through the math. We'll do that when we get there, but it's kind of confusing. So let's talk about shaping.